Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 12 from the series on the book of Ephesians is titled The Call to Stand. It's ready for teaching on September 16, having been written by John McVeigh, and your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 9. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We always thank you for your word because it reveals you to us. And this week as we study about taking a stand and being strong in the Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide us. May the words that we read this week from your word not only be inspiring, but may they guide us in our daily walk. May they give us hope and comfort for the future. And may our lives be such that, because of what we've learned, others may know that we've walked with you this week. And today, Lord, I'd like to pray for Thelma Ray in the Virgin Islands, for Milamo Hambringa in Zambia, for Edivaldo Costa in Brazil, and Thiago in Brazil as well, and Jose Antonio in the Dominican Republic, Verilyn Harrigan in Anguilla, and all the students, all the Adventist students at Pacific Adventist University in Papua New Guinea, and the Adventist students at Garoka University in Papua New Guinea, who I know many of are listening to the reading of the lesson each week. Lord, I pray that you'll be with them and bless them and bless each of us and our families. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. And it's read by a young pastor from the outback of New South Wales in Australia. Hi, my name is Nathan Andrioli and I'm the pastor at Coonabarabran and Coonamble Churches. Here is your memory text for this week. It comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. It says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And again, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Bleary-eyed, the servant stumbles out of his lodgings and sees an alarming sight. A large, well-equipped and hostile army with troops, horses and chariots everywhere. Speaking to the prophet Elisha, he stammers out the news, along with his harried question, O sir, what will we do now? Elisha responds, Don't be afraid, for there are more on our side than on theirs. A response that fails to register in the face of his servant. Elisha, pulling him close, prays for him, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The prophet's prayer is answered immediately. The servant steps to the ramparts again, but this time the veil between the seen and the unseen lifts, and now he sees not one army, but two. As we read in Second Kings six fifteen to seventeen, the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. In composing Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 20, Paul prays for an enhanced vision for believers so that they will be able to see the full reality of the great controversy and to draw hope from what it reveals to them. Sunday, September 10, Battle Speech Study Paul's ringing conclusion to his letter, Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. What does Paul's battle cry mean to us today as combatants in the great controversy? Well, let's read Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness and in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. What does Paul's battle cry mean to us today as combatants in the great controversy. Paul concludes Ephesians with a call to battle, urging believers to take their stand in the church's war against evil in these verses we've just read. He begins with an overarching exhortation to be strong in the Lord, verse 10, which he repeats as a call to put on the whole armour of God in verse 11. He supports this call by specifying a purpose, to be able to stand against the devil's schemes in verse 11, and by offering a rationale. The battle is against powerful spiritual forces of evil in verse 12. In a detailed way, Paul then reissues the call to arms. Believers are to take up the whole armour of God in order to stand firm in battle in verse 13, donning the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the shield, the helmet and the sword in verses 14 to 17. Paul invites believers, now fully armed and ready to enter the fray, to do what soldiers on the ancient battlefield might do, and that is pray in verses 18 to 20. By echoing battle exhortations or eve of battle speeches in the Old Testament, Paul speaks of the church's mission in terms of military conflict and weapons. Paul signals this in his first overarching command, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, in verse 10. Battle exhortations in the Old Testament underline the idea that Israel's success in battle does not depend on the superiority of its own weapons or an army that outnumbers its foes. Well, for instance, we're going to look at several passages here. First of all is Deuteronomy 20, verses 2 to 4. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint, do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And Judges chapter 7 verses 15 to 18. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Then he divided the three hundred men into three companies, and he put a trumpet into each man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers, and he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And then we read in Second Chronicles 20 verses 13 to 20, Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, 
the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all of you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down amongst them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook, before the wilderness of Jeroel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Israel, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And Second Chronicles 32, verses 6 to 8. Then he set military captains over the people, gathered them together to him in the open square of the city gate, and gave them encouragement, saying, Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And finally, Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 14, 19 and 20. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your houses. And then verse 19. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers and the rest of the people, The work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So that underlines the idea that Israel's success in battle does not depend on the superiority of its own weapons or an army that outnumbers its foes. Rather, victory results from depending on the presence and power of God. The key to the Israelites' success was not confidence in themselves, but firm trust in God's power and his provision for their success. Paul makes bold use of these themes to exhort believers to be 1. active in pursuing the church's mission, 2. attentive to the unseen dimensions that impact their lives and witness, 3. cognizant of the divine provision for their success, and 4. always alert to the importance of unity and collaboration among believers. And so to finish today, what should Paul's warning that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against supernatural enemies, teach us about where our only hope of victory is? Monday, September 11. Finding Strength in Christ Paul ends his letter with a powerful call to battle that draws together themes and ideas important to the letter as a whole. He begins by announcing the overarching theme of the conclusion, often in the tone of a commander's battle cry in Ephesians 6 verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. The rest of the passage, Ephesians 6 11 to 20, illustrates and unpacks this large theme. Read again Ephesians six ten to 20 How do you see the reality of the great controversy, which involves literal supernatural powers, as central to Paul's point? 
Why is keeping this crucial truth before us so important in our own daily walk with God? Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak." Paul identifies Christ as the source of believer's strength with his phrase, in the Lord and in the power of his might, in verse 10, since Lord refers to Christ as is consistently the case in Ephesians. In Ephesians 2, 21, we read, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. And chapter 5 verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, Walk as children of light. And chapter 6, verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And verse 21, But that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychius, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you. The Church's Strength, G. G. Finlay writes in the Epistle to the Ephesians, page 398, The Church's Strength lies in the almightiness of her risen Lord, the captain of her warfare. End of quote. Paul uses repetition in Ephesians 6.10, employing the synonyms power and might to underline his point. The power to be exhibited by the church is not inherent in believers, but is derived. It comes from the Lord, from Christ. Paul summarizes here an important theme of the letter, God's power shared with believers, in Ephesians 1, 19-22. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. And chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love... Strength for every current and future conflict is to be found in believers' solidarity with the resurrected and exalted Christ.
While the initial command announces Christ as active in providing strength to believers in verse 10 of chapter 6, all three members of the Godhead are engaged in strengthening them for spiritual combat against evil. God the Father makes his own weapons available as the armour of God, as we read in verses 11 and 13. And we compare that with Isaiah 59 verse 17, which reads, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head and put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Earlier, Paul has identified the Spirit as active in strengthening believers. Paul prayed that God may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, in verse 16 of chapter 3. Here, it is the Spirit who issues the sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, in chapter 6, verse 17. Also, believers are to pray at all times in the Spirit, in verse 18. Paul wishes his hearers to understand that the triune God is fully engaged in equipping them to battle against these evil powers. Tuesday, September 12, The Great Controversy in Paul's Letters Read Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 14, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 to 8, and 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. How do these verses compare with Ephesians 6, 10 to 20? Why do you think Paul uses this kind of imagery? Well, first of all, let's read Romans 13, beginning at verse 11, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh, to fulfill its lusts. And First Thessalonians 5, beginning at verse 6, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of of salvation and second corinthians 10 beginning at verse 3 for though we walk in the flesh we do not war according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in god for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of god bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In his letters, Paul frequently employs military language and imagery, inviting believers to mimic exemplary soldierly behaviour. While Ephesians 6, 10-20 represents his longest and most concentrated use, Military language exhibits one of his major ways of understanding the gospel story. Having conquered the rulers and authorities at the cross, as it said in Colossians 2.15, the exalted Christ now works out the result of that victory from his position as exalted Lord over the powers, as we read in Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Recruiting his followers as combatants in the cosmic war, Christ leads the armies of light toward a grand day of victory, as we read in these following verses. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 to 58. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, 
and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. And in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And Romans 16.10, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Gathering up Paul's uses of military symbolism, we see that he understands the conflict between good and evil to be, as Peter W. Mackey writes in St. Paul's Cosmic War Myth, a military version of the Gospel, page 1, a long-running cosmic war. Battles ebb and flow between two armies which face each other down through the ages until one wins the final confrontation. End of quote. Paul's frequent theme of cosmic war is also part of the fabric of Ephesians. In his call to arms, in Ephesians 6, 10-20, Paul draws together elements of the cosmic conflict that he has already used. God's empowering of believers with immense power from Ephesians 1, 18 to 20 and Ephesians 3, 16 to 20. Christ's victory and exaltation over the powers in chapter 1, verses 20 to 23. Believers as a resurrected army of the once dead, but now empowered by their identity with the exalted Christ and able to fight against their former dark master in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. The church's role in revealing to the powers their coming doom in chapter 3, verse 10. The use of Psalm 68, 18 to portray Christ as the conquering divine warrior in chapter 4 verses 7 to 11 and the call for believers to put on gospel clothing in chapter 4 verses 20 to 24. When called to put on God's full armour, we are well prepared to understand the central role of cosmic conflict but also we are to remain firm in the assurance that we have of participating in Christ's ultimate victory. And so to finish today, what are some of the ways that you personally have experienced the reality not only of this conflict, this cosmic conflict, but of the victory we can claim for ourselves in Jesus? Why is understanding his victory for us so foundational to our hope and experience? Wednesday, September 13, Standing on the Ancient Battlefield Read through Ephesians 6, 10-20, noting each time Paul uses some form of the verb stand. Why is this idea so important to him? Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 10. Remember, we're looking for the word stand or something like it. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And... Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, 
and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We must understand Paul's military metaphor in the context of the ancient battlefield. What did it mean to stand, as we read in verses 11, 13 and 14? Does the verb suggest a defensive-only posture? Battle speeches included in the writings of Thucydides, one of the great classical authors of battle literature, highlight three successive actions that must occur if a side is to be victorious. 1. Soldiers must close with the enemy which means they must march to meet their foes. Then, too, they must attack and stand fast, or stand our ground, fighting hand to hand with the foes. And finally, three, they must beat back the enemies. As Thucydides wrote in the Peloponnesian War, pages 1 to 5. The key moment of an ancient battle occurred with the second of these three actions, when the two opposing phalanxes came crashing together in, as Victor Davis Hanson writes in The Western Way of War, a terrible cacophony of smashed bronze, wood and flesh, which which ancient author Xenophon refers to as that awful crash, end of quote. Standing firm, holding one's ground at this strategic moment, was the great challenge of ancient battle. In the close combat that would ensure, each side would seek momentum for the push. Paul's call to arms reflects combat in which soldiers were bunched together, as uh, Victor Davis Hanson writes in the same book, page 152, giving and receiving hundreds of blows at close range, end of quote. This is confirmed by Paul's depiction of the church's battle against its foes as a wrestling match in verse 12, and we'll see more about this in tomorrow's lesson, and in his use of an intensive form of the verb to stand in verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. This is no relaxed stance. To stand, then, is to be vigorously engaged in battle, employing every weapon in close order combat, a point obvious from the military imagery in Paul's earlier exhortation to be found standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, as we read in Philippians 1.27. And so, to finish today, read Hebrews 12, verse 4. How does this verse help encapsulate what it means to stand in the Lord? What is the corporate nature of this standing as well? Hebrews 12 verse 4 You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Thursday, September 14, Wrestling Against Evil Powers What do you judge to be Paul's purpose in listing a variety of titles for the evil spiritual powers depicted in Ephesians 1.21, Ephesians 3.10 and Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 20? Well, let's have a look at those verses first. Ephesians 1.21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And Ephesians 3.10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And Ephesians 6.10-20, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. 
Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it... I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul describes our struggle in verse 12 of chapter 6 using a Greek word for the competition between wrestlers, parle. Since wrestling was regarded as excellent preparation for battle, this is an appropriate description of the weapon against weapon and hand to hand combat that takes place when armies clash. Paul is emphasising the reality of believers' close struggle against the evil powers. Here are the titles he gives them in these three passages. Ephesians 1.21, he says, Every ruler or every rule. Ephesians 3.10, the rulers. Ephesians 6.12, the rulers. Ephesians 1.21, every authority. Ephesians 3.10, the authorities. Ephesians 6.12, the authorities. Ephesians 1.21, every power. Ephesians 6.12, the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Ephesians 1.21, every dominion. Ephesians 6.12, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, and Ephesians one twenty one, every name named. In his broad descriptions, every name named in Ephesians one twenty one, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places six twelve, Paul does affirm that all evil and supernatural powers are subjugated to Christ, as in one twenty one. However, in any battle. It is never a good strategy to underestimate the forces on the opposing side. Paul warns that we do not just confront human enemies, but spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places in 6.12. Led by a wily general, the devil, in 6.11. Let's read 6.11 again. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. However, while we must be on the alert against our powerful foes, we need not be daunted by them. God is present with us in the battle, we read in verse 10, and has supplied us with the finest of weaponry, his own armour, the armour of God, as we read in verse 11. And we'll compare that with Isaiah 59, verses 15 to 17. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him, and there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness it sustained him. And he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head, he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and he was clad with zeal as a cloak. He has placed at our disposal his truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation, and the Holy Spirit, as we read in verses 13 to 17. With God going before us, and our being equipped from head to toe in the armour he has supplied, we cannot fail, as you read in these following verses. Firstly, Romans 16.20, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 and 24. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. 
and 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And so to finish today, what should the reality of these supernatural evil powers, against whom we ourselves are utterly helpless, teach us regarding why we must grasp hold of the Lord Jesus, who is not only greater than these powers, but has already defeated them. Friday, September 15. Our work is an aggressive one, Ellen White writes in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald of May 8, 1888. And as faithful soldiers of Jesus, we must bear the bloodstained banner into the very strongholds of the enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. If we will consent to lay down our arms, to lower the bloodstained banner, to become the captives and servants of Satan, we will be released from the conflict and the suffering. But this peace will be gained only at the loss of Christ and heaven. We cannot accept peace on such conditions. Let it be war, war, to the end of earth's history, rather than peace through apostasy and sin. End of quote. How does Ephesians 6, 10-20 relate to the book of Revelation? The passage exhibits the same basic view of last-day events or eschatology as the battle motif in the book of Revelation. And we referred here to Revelation 12. And you'll remember, Revelation 12 begins in verse 1 with, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labour, in pain, to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. And then in verse 7 we read, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. And then we read in uh, verses 13 to 17 about the woman being persecuted. Verse 17 reads, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then Revelation 16, verses 12 to 16. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon and Revelation 19 verses 17 to 21. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the angels that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword, which proceedeth from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10. 
Now, when the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, for ever and ever. In both places, the people of God are under attack by the enemy who is in heavenly places and is active and powerful in the present eon or age. In both, the people of God are encouraged by the picture of the future eon. Jordan Kalev Sekov writes in Eschatology Ephesians, page 233 to 235. Further, both scenarios explicitly point to the final battle when the enemy will be conquered completely, after which the new aeon will be established forever, a new age in which the final glorious state of the people of God and the eternal doom of the enemy will be evident. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, when have you most clearly confronted the powers of darkness? What have you found to be the most helpful strategies at those times? Two, informed by Ephesians six ten to 20 how would you minister to someone who seems especially oppressed by the spiritual forces of evil, as it says in Ephesians six twelve in the ESV? And three, how do we best discern and reject the schemes of the devil, as we read in Ephesians six eleven? For example, how often do you feel ready to give up your faith because you feel that you are too sinful? too corrupt to be saved. Who was putting that thought in your head? Christ or the forces of darkness? Especially at times like that, why must you claim many of the wonderful promises we have been given in Jesus? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Finding the Right Words by Andrew McChesney Alexei Arishanyan, a 33-year-old Ukrainian national living in Poland, noticed a Bible and many other religious books in the apartment of a woman whose windows he was installing. Alexei belonged to a group of church members who distributed Ellen White's The Great Controversy. It was a difficult task with few receptive people, and he prayed for an opportunity to share a book in this home. Then the woman, who was about 40 and lived alone, offered him a cup of tea. Alexei sat and sipped the tea as the woman went about her activities. She sang as she worked. Alexei prayed about what to do. Finally, he spoke. I see that you love to read books, he said. Yes, I really love to read, she said. You might have noticed that I don't have a TV. I read all the time. The woman resumed working and singing. Alexei had an idea. Are you a Christian? he asked. Yes, I sing in a choir at church, she said. I also go to church at Foxal 8, Alexei said, giving the address of the only Seventh-day Adventist church in Poland's capital, Warsaw. I'm a Protestant. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Seeing that the woman was listening intently, Alexei grew bolder. I'd like to give you a gift. A book about the history of Christianity, he said. It's really interesting. The woman agreed to look at the book. As Alexei took his tools out to the car, he worried that she wouldn't open the door when he returned with the book. But she welcomed him back in. She was visibly impressed with the handsomely bound volume, and she immediately began to leaf through it. From the expression on her face, Alexei could see that she didn't agree with everything that she saw. It's up to you to accept or reject what's in the book, he said. The woman accepted the book, saying, thank you very much. The pair spoke a little longer and Alexei was filled with joy when he left. He was so happy that he had found a way to give her the book. I could have stayed silent, he says. 
but she had the right to decide whether to accept the book or not. My duty only was to offer it to her. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will go to the Trans-European Division, which includes Poland. Thank you for planning a generous offering. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Kurumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand, it became a podcast in July 2007 and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.